is often said that you can't reinvent the wheel, but in spite of this phrase, we shouldn't dismiss the fact that we can consider its replacement. Carl von Linder had developed the industrial cooling machine in 1873. He was Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the Munich Polytechnic. One of his students was Rudolf Diesel. He graduated in January 1880 and moved to Paris where he assisted his former Munich professor with the design and construction of a modern refrigeration and ice plant. Diesel became the director of the plant one year later. In the cooling process used at the plant, a crank was rotated, pushing a piston in a cylinder to compress a gas, releasing the pressure at another point in the system after the compressed gas had been water-cooled would result in a refrigerating effect. Rudolf Diesel thought about using this process in reverse. Igniting a flammable liquid within the cylinder would result in the ignited gases pushing the piston. This could then be used to rotate a crankshaft, which could then directly drive the wheels of a vehicle. So, in 1893, the diesel engine was born. This principle has held right up to the present day in every industrial combustion engine, whether used for vehicles or in stationary situations. For instance, motors for electricity production. Although this has been successful in revolutionising the transport and electrical industries, the fact that only 40% of the chemical energy can be converted into kinetic energy using this method seems to have been overlooked up until now. In standard contemporary motor types, the ignition timing point occurs at the top of the stroke of the piston, when the fuel-air mixture has been compressed to the point where it will provide the most energy. The problem is, at this point, the connecting rod is virtually upright and therefore at a minimal angle to the crankshaft. Mechanically, this is the least efficient moment for the transfer of reciprocating energy into rotational torque. Only on leaving this position does the efficiency start to rise. At this later point in time, the pressure within the cylinder has reduced appreciably and detrimentally. This problem is inherent in all motors which rely on a transverse motion of the piston being converted into rotational torque of a crankshaft. Some alternative solutions have been proposed, including the Vankel design. This has its own inherent drawbacks, similar to those of a piston-driven motor. The conversion of combustion energy into rotational torque takes place through a small eccentric offset of the bearing axis of the Vankel rotary piston to the axis of the crankshaft. Mechanical constraints only allow a small eccentric offset of these axes and therefore only a small angle of leverage. The TEEN motor is an engineering solution to this, up till now, unavoidable problem. The TEEN motor is based on a transverse reciprocating motion acting along the axis of motion over a helical transfer. This allows the most efficient timing to be chosen. It is not predefined by the constraints of the system. The TEEN motor is capable of increasing the efficiency of the energy transfer, allowing a substantially better use of the available fossil fuels. The TEEN motor is based upon a cylinder block containing two combustion chambers moving on two stationary pistons. It transfers its lateral motion into rotational torque via helical surfaces along the central axis of the motor. The angle of torque conversion is the same at any position within the combustion process. Additionally, the compression ratio within the combustion chamber can be adjusted instantaneously to provide the maximum efficiency or compensate for varying fuels. The engineering behind the teen motor. Into a base plate, a spindle is mounted. Into this spindle, guided by a slot in the base plate upper, we mount two end supports. Hollow connecting tubes are then attached to these movable end supports. Pistons are then attached to the internal ends of these connecting tubes. 
Each piston contains the injection nozzle and spark plug, each accessible from the outside of the motor through the hollow connecting tube. The two stationary pistons are enclosed in a double cylinder unit. The cylinder linings are press fitted. These contain ports matched to those of the double cylinder unit. This contains a dividing wall between the two combustion chambers and openings which serve as inlet and exhaust ports. The dividing wall of the double cylinder unit, positioned between the stationary pistons, creates two combustion chambers. The double cylinder unit is a sliding fit on the pistons, similar to a standard contemporary piston motor. This allows, on combustion, a transverse action of the double cylinder unit. The transverse action has now to be converted into rotational movement. To this purpose, a helically cut alignment tube is fitted to each end of the unit. This reacts to an alignment bush, which is fixed to a part of the main frame of the motor, the dividing sleeve. Similar engineering solutions have had the following problem in the past. If the alignment tube and alignment bush happen to have been facing each other exactly, the last time the motor was stopped, the two tips of these units would collide, possibly causing damage, but more importantly, one would not know if the motor was going to restart going forwards or backwards. To remedy this potential problem, the teen motor has been conceived with a directional control mechanism, the control shuttle. The control shuttle provides a large bearing surface area for the double cylinder unit to act upon to transfer the reciprocating linear movement into rotational torque. The control shuttle acts upon the similarly shaped control tubes. The control tubes are fixed to each end of the double cylinder unit, while the control shuttles are fitted around the dividing sleeves, allowing them transverse motion. Control shuttles have a shaped slot into which a pin, fixed to the motor outer housing, fits. This slot and pin constrain the movement of the control shuttle, forcing it to follow the helical shape of the slot. The control shuttle movement is guided by the helical slot in the alignment tube, acting on the fixed pin of the control shuttle. The slot is helical in shape, but has a varying offset to the shape of the helical surface of the alignment tube. This variation in offset guides the control shuttle into and out of contact with the helical surface of the alignment tube at specific times of the sequence. The control surfaces of the motor ensure that the tips of the alignment tube and alignment bush never come into contact with each other. The control shuttle serves another purpose. While transversing its space between the double cylinder unit and the fixed flange of the dividing sleeve, it compresses the intake air, acting much like a turbocharger. The advantages of the system are apparent. The starting rotation direction of the teen motor is permanently controlled. One benefit of this is that there is no requirement for a flywheel mass as is usual on today's internal combustion engines. This also leads to an extremely low idle speed for this motor. The control shuttle compresses a large volume of air to fill the combustion chamber from the moment of starting the motor, instantly providing maximum torque. To utilize the rotational motion of the double cylinder unit, a drive unit is required. This is provided by castellations in the alignment tube, engaging with the corresponding millings within the drive shaft, thereby providing the torque to two toothed gears. 
Thus we have achieved that out of a periodical shuttle motion of the double cylinder unit, a defined rotation is assured. Additionally, the end supports can be driven by the reduction gearing incorporated into the spindle to adjust the compression ratio to suit conditions of temperature and alternative fuels, or under differing air pressures at high altitude. This adjustability applies even whilst running the motor, allowing for continual control of the combustion process. The starting compression ratio can be adjusted up to 35 to 1, thus eliminating the need for glow plugs in the case of diesel fuels. The intake air system. Through the air filter, the control shuttle draws air through an intake valve, compresses and returns the compressed intake air through the valve block. The intake valve closes. The control shuttle compresses and forces the intake air into the compressed air channel through the air channel valve. Description of the strokes of the teen motor. The teen motor is a two-stroke cylindrical rotational motor with constant high torque production. For the sake of simplicity, I'll start with the left-hand combustion chamber. Shortly before reaching top dead center, the fuel is injected into the chamber. The fuel injection lasts 1.5 milliseconds at an injection pressure of 2000 to 2500 bar. Depending on the fuel used at the time, the combustion is performed by a spark plug or by self-ignition due to the high pressure in the chamber. The combustion raises the pressure in the left cylinder and drives the double cylinder unit to the right. On the right hand side, the control shuttle and the alignment bush are in contact with the alignment tube. The double cylinder unit, driven by the pressure in the left combustion chamber, is forced to follow the helical contour. On reaching the top dead center point, the right hand alignment tube has also reached the apex of the helix in the alignment tube. Due to the simultaneous arrival at this position, and the ignition within the right hand chamber, the engaging surfaces at the apex of the curve remain unstressed. On arriving at the point of change of direction at bottom dead center, the exhaust channel reaches the exhaust port and allows the exhaust gases to be expelled into the exhaust pipe. After the pressure of exhaust gases in the left combustion chamber has been released, the intake channel reaches the intake port with the pressurized intake air. With both the intake and exhaust ports open, the pressurized intake air can expel the last remains of exhaust gases into the exhaust pipe. A large volume of intake air is also introduced into the exhaust pipe. The exhaust channel leaves the exhaust port through the intake port, which is still open, 
pressurized air is introduced into the left hand combustion chamber. Now the intake port is closed and the pure confined intake air can be compressed in the chamber. Shortly after arriving at top dead center, the fuel injection and ignition can take place. In all, there are only two strokes of the motor. One of the advantages of the teen motor is that during the complete work stroke, all the energy of combustion is converted into torque and only on arrival at bottom dead center the exhaust port and then the intake port are opened. The separate strokes of the motor are first stroke exhaust intake compression second stroke combustion expansion each stroke turns the teen motor by 90 degrees. This means that for each full rotation of the double cylinder unit, there are two ignitions on the left and two ignitions on the right. Therefore, in all, there are four ignitions per revolution, each at 90 degrees to another. A flywheel mass, as is standard on other types of motor, is therefore not necessary on the teen motor. Piston pressure over a work stroke of 96 mm. Piston pressure in comparison to torque produced by a standard piston motor over a work stroke. Piston pressure in comparison to torque produced by a teen motor over a work stroke. Comparison of torque produced by a standard piston motor to a teen motor over a work stroke. The obvious difference between the two curves shows the presently unused torque and therefore the wasted energy which until now has not been able to be used. We must await the final testing of an optimized prototype before we know for sure that the theoretical value is achieved. Even if these goals are only partially achieved, it would still be a great leap forward for humankind and the global ecosystem. The teen motor is inherently suitable for combination into multiple cylinder configurations for greater smoothness and power. The inventor of this motor does not claim to have reinvented the wheel, but if successful, to have increased efficiency and reduced pollution in many circumstances. Isn't that a thought worth having?